God loves a cheerful giver. So writes the Apostle Paul to the Christians in Corinth. God loves a cheerful giver. And the Greek word that is translated as cheerful is hilaros. And so some have translated St. Paul's sentence to read, God loves a hilarious giver, or God loves one who gives with hilarity. But Greek scholars suggest the meaning of the sentence may be closer to this. God loves the one who gives with a, a laughing heart, or God loves the one who gives with dancing eyes, or God loves those who pour themselves out cheerfully, joy, joyously, readily, gamely, with spontaneity and abandon. Now, if it is true that God loves those who give cheerfully, with dancing eyes and laughing hearts, it might be just the thing to experience a little hilarity, a little joy and cheer this July morning, to indulge in some mirth, indeed, perhaps even to partake of a joke or two. Which reminds me, why did the fish poke its head out of the water when Jesus taught by the lake shore? Because it was hooked. Why did the vegan go deep sea fishing? Just for the halibut. Why do sea monsters, what do sea monsters eat? Fish and ships. <laughs> Jokes are not unheard of in sermons. Indeed, there is a school of homiletics that recommends every sermon begin with a joke, and aren't you glad we don't adhere to that school of homiletics? But jokes are something to warm you up, break the ice, create a little community. On the other hand, there are those who believe that this whole church thing should be utterly serious and dignified at all times and obviously joke less. John Chrysostom, a monk and early church father and fourth century bishop of Constantinople, warned Christians, do not laugh. Why? Well, he explained, Jesus never laughed, at least there is no evidence that he did. And Benedict, founder of the Benedictines, and Augustine, one of the great theologians of the early church, were both of similar opinion. They thought laughter indecent. Christians, they reasoned, were far too full of sin to engage in the frivolity of laughter. Christians, they believed, must focus on the serious, no laughing matter of saving their sorry souls, and there was little time for anything else. Maybe you are familiar with Umberto Eco's The Name of the Rose, among the best-selling books ever published. It is an intricate and wild and woolly murder mystery situated in a medieval Italian monastery. And the novel, novel is premised about the, um, the suppression of humor in the church in the 14th century. The novel revolves around a monk who has discovered a long-lost hidden book by Aristotle on comedy. And the idea in his world is nothing short of scandalous, even perilous. Imagine Aristotle, that great philosopher of antiquity, writing on comedy and promoting the virtues of laughter. The monk feels that if the book is revealed to the world, it would, its impact would be ruinous, even calamitous for Christianity. He therefore poisons the pages of the book so that anyone who discovers and reads it will die. Speaking of humor, did you hear about the crab who went to a seafood disco? He pulled a muscle. How does an octopus go to war? Well armed. Why don't oysters share their pearls? Because they're shellfish. What kind of music should you listen to while fishing? Uh, something catchy. In the ancient Christian dispute over laughter, I side with the Apostle Paul, believing that a little hilarity never hurt anyone. And not only does it not hurt, we have the benefit of a kind of science unknown in the Middle Ages, a science that studies the physiological effects of laughter on our bodies. Laughter, it seems, it's good for us. It's therapeutic. It even releases endorphins if you laugh hard enough. So what did the fish say when he posted bail? I'm off the hook. Why don't fish like basketball? 
they're afraid of the net. Which fish can perform operations? The sturgeon. What do you call a fish with a tie? So fishdicated. Now it's true that the New Testament nowhere explicitly says Jesus laughed. It does explicitly say Jesus wept. And John Chrysostom wants us to weep in imitation of Jesus. But I say we do weep. God knows we do a lot of weeping. There is much to weep over. Am I right? Yet despite the hardships Jesus and his followers experienced, despite the poverty all around them, and the tyranny of an occupying empire, and the cruelty of class and caste in first century Palestine, and the prevalence of disease without benefit of health care, despite all of this, nay, because of this, Jesus and his followers lived, loved, and poured themselves out with laughing hearts and dancing eyes. They were cheerful, eager, and they were game. And perhaps no story better illustrates this than the great catch. The fishermen have been out all night long, working their nets, positioning their boats, struggling against wind and tide and against their own weariness. Now, this is no weekend pleasure trip. This is business. This is work. This is their livelihood. It's how they feed their families, how they make their way in the world. And the fish that they toil to haul in are what stands between them and empty bellies. The fish is what gives them dignity and purpose and identity in their village. Yet this particular night, the fishermen labor in vain. They catch nothing. With the dawn of the new day, they return to shore. They are weary and they are defeated. They're cleaning their nets when Jesus happens by. He climbs into a boat and instructs one of the fishermen, Simon Peter, to put out into the deep water and let down his nets for a catch. But they've been out all night. They just finished cleaning the nets. They were ready to pack it in, go home, get some rest. Despite all this, when Jesus instructs them to start over, to do it all again, try one more time, put out into the deep water, they do, with a kind of reckless abandon, with a shrug of the shoulders and a what the heck and what can we lose and what can it hurt kind of attitude, with cheerfulness and maybe a little hilarity, Simon, Peter, and the others ready their nets, climb back into the boats, and head back out to fish. Which reminds me, there are two fish in a tank. One turns to the other and asks, do you know how to drive this thing? What did one shark say to another shark after he ate a clownfish? This tastes funny. What did the magician say to the fisherman? Pick a cod, C-O-D, any cod. <laughs> did you hear about the fight in the kitchen? A fish got battered. The story of the great catch and the call of the disciples is a central inaugurating story in Christianity. Indeed, the whole Christian enterprise depends on these fishermen agreeing to follow Jesus. Depends moreover on their cheerful, joyous game, will give it a try attitude. Because they respond to Jesus with such an attitude, they find themselves embarked upon an adventure of discipleship that literally changes the course of human history. Christian discipleship is for all of us and has been since that day an adventure in generous living, a way of life marked by spontaneity and abandon, a way of facing the world, as mean and hard as the world can be, with dancing eyes and a laughing heart. As you contemplate your own discipleship, how to follow Jesus in this world-weary time, in this dark season of partisan divides, of caged children, saber-rattling, and climate calamity. Allow yourselves to laugh, savor satire, relish irony, study the cartoons in The New Yorker, linger over late-night skits, indulge in gallows humor. For laughter can be a pressure-release valve, 
Humor offers us distance, allowing us to gain altitude and perspective on what is sometimes too close and too awful to see clearly. A good, long, hard laugh releases endorphins. So Christian, if you need to get high, do it that way. Speaking of which, why do fish always know how much they weigh? They have their own scales. What do you call a lazy crayfish? A slobster. How do shellfish get to the hospital? In a clambulance. What did the why did the fish blush? Because he saw the ocean's bottom. I hope God and you will forgive me these jokes in church. I can only trust that God relishes our laughter, our joy, and indeed our cheerful, sometimes hilarious attempts to follow the call of Christ. I believe that God understands what it is for us to laugh through our tears and cry through our laughter. And this I believe, that laughter is both human and divine. For your sake, for the sake of the church, may you experience dancing eyes and laughing hearts as you respond to Christ's call upon your life. May laughter refresh and renew you for each new day. May it cause you to clamor back into the struggle, make you put out into the deep water, and with abandon, dive into the work of discipleship. And finally, I leave you with this one last thought. Keep your friends close and your anemones closer. <laughs>